So, I'll tell you a bit of a story that starts with this animal here, the, the Gila monster or Gila monster. So Bijurion is the, the trade name for exenotide. So it's the once weekly preparation of exenotide. And it's derived, it's the synthetic version. It's the synthetic version of a protein that was found in the saliva from this creature called the Gila monster. And this um, protein is important, particularly for this animal, because we think this, this animal needs to have a very strict control on its own metabolism, because it only eats twice a year. <laughs> now, exenotide or exendin is very similar to a hormone that we all produce called GLP-1, or glucagon-like peptide 1. And our GLP-1 acts on GLP-1 receptors. An exenotide can also stimulate the GLP-1 receptor, and so it has the same effects as GLP-1 does in people. And there's a whole bunch now of, of these um, synthetic GLP-1 receptor drugs. Exenotide is one, then liraglutide, exenotide, the magnetide, and a few others that are still under um, numbers only. So just to tell you what GLP-1 is all about, when you, when you eat a meal, you produce GLP-1 from the cells in the intestine. And the GLP-1 circulates in the bloodstream and it acts on the GLP-1 receptors in the pancreas. So this stimulates the pancreas to produce insulin and it keeps the control of your blood sugar. And the good thing is it, is it makes high blood sugar normal, but it doesn't make normal blood sugar low. So there isn't any risk of getting a hypoglycemic attack with GLP-1. But GLP-1 is uh, eliminated quickly in the bloodstream, so it only has a very short duration of effect. Whereas the, the synthetic drugs, including exenotide, doesn't get eliminated in the bloodstream and therefore can circulate and have effects on the GLP-1 receptors in the pancreas for many hours. And therefore is a very good way of keeping consistent blood sugar control. So therefore it's a licensed treatment for type 2 diabetes by stimulating the GLP-1 receptors in the pancreas. Now we have GLP-1 receptors um, in the pancreas, but we also have them in the heart, in the liver, in adipose tissue, in the stomach, and in the brain. And so different investigators that specialize in these organs are interested in what happens when you stimulate the GLP-1 receptors in diseases of these organs. And of course, we're particularly interested in how we can protect nerve cells by stimulating GLP-1 receptors in the brain. So what's, what's Parkinson's got to do with GLP-1 and diabetes? So the first thing to say is there's a clear risk of developing Parkinson's disease if you have type 2 diabetes. And this comes from big epidemiology. If you look at 6 million people from the UK who attended hospital and you compare them to 2 million people with type 2 diabetes, those with diabetes had a higher risk of developing Parkinson's disease than those who didn't. So these are such big numbers that there's no doubt about that association. And what's important is if you look at the age of onset of diabetes, if you've got diabetes in your 20s, 30s or early 40s, your risk of Parkinson's disease is four times as high as someone in the same age group without diabetes. If you've got it a bit later, your risk starts to fall down to 1.7 if you're in the late 40s, 50s and early 60s. And then it diminishes. So if you've got very late onset diabetes, your risk is only fractionally elevated. So there is a time duration dependent link between diabetes and Parkinson's disease. And what's more, if you have both, I mean, most people don't have Parkinson's and diabetes, but if you do have both, then your Parkinson's is worse. You're more likely to get early dementia and you're more likely to get balance problems. So it's a more malignant form of Parkinson's disease if you happen to have diabetes as well. And if you don't have diabetes, but you just have a tendency towards slightly higher blood sugar, then your rate of progression of your Parkinson's disease is also faster. So, and this, this may be um, among many, many of us in the room, that we just have a slightly higher blood sugar than someone else. And if you get Parkinson's disease, your rate of progression, even over the first few years, is faster. Now this might just be a relationship between high blood glucose 
and some and and the problems that, that occur in the brain. So, so this cartoon here suggests that if you have more of these green circulating blood glucose um, molecules, then they cross into the brain, and the more gl glucose that gets into the cells, the more of these toxic things called AGEs, advanced glycation end products, that have an impact on how alpha-synuclein is most likely to misfold. And the alpha-synuclein is the protein which is toxic to nerve cells in Parkinson's disease. So it might be a simple relationship that higher blood sugar more likely to get this alpha-synuclein poisoned in our cells. But it might not just be as simple as that. It might be some relationship between what's causing your diabetes peripherally, which is insulin resistance, and what is a risk factor for um, Parkinson's disease in the brain, which is insulin resistance in the brain. So insulin signaling is an important process in the brain most of the insulin that gets to the brain is produced in the pancreas, but there is some insulin that's produced in the brain itself. And it's involved in metabolism and sensing the amount of glucose in the circulation, but is also important in cell survival. And that's mediated through a protein called AKT. So if you have insulin in the brain, it hits the insulin receptor, and as a result of successful insulin receptor stimulation, you get higher levels of AKT, which leads to cell survival. So what's, what's this got to do with PD? Well, we think that there's good evidence that there's insulin resistance in Parkinson's disease. So in this cartoon, what's happening is the insulin receptor here in the, the pale green is stimulated by insulin. It boosts AKT and that AKT has a role on the mitochondria that Simon was telling you about and also proteins that influence alpha-synuclein and inflammation. And when you add exenatide to the, the situation, it hits the GLP-1 receptor, and that has a direct effect on this pathway to boost the amount of AKT and therefore protect the cell. It, interestingly, it may also have an effect on increasing the amount of dopamine that the cell can make, and therefore people can feel better, because not, not just through cell survival, but because the cells are starting to make a bit more dopamine. So, Simon's introduced this a little bit already. There are different formulations of exenatide. It comes in a, a pen that you can give twice daily. It comes in a, a tray that you have to mix up a powder and inject yourself. Or it comes in a nice pen device that you pinch a roll of flour around your tummy and you inject um, through a very small needle at the end of this pen through the skin. And in the first trial, we used the, the twice daily injection and we recruited 44 people and we recruit, um, randomized them into two different groups. And we found that those people that used exenatide in addition to their regular medications had a better trajectory from that point forward. I don't know if that shows up at all. The, the dark blue line compared with the, those who just had their regular medication, the light blue line. And this was a mirror image, both the, the movement problems that they have and the cognitive problems they had um, were um, clearly better in the exenotide group. And what's more, the, the advantage persisted even a year after they stopped the medication, which was a good proof of concept that this may have done something at their rate of subsequent decline. And what it did, it de-risked bigger and um, you know, more substantial investment into looking at this drug and it got the manufacturer of the drug willing to supply us with adequate amounts of drug and placebo and it got the Michael J Fox Foundation willing to, to fund a formal double-blind placebo controlled trial. So we recruited people, uh, this is back in 2013 now, who's had a disease duration of six years and we randomised them into two groups to either have the bidura on the once weekly preparation for 48 weeks, the best part of a year. And then we had a, a washout period. So they stopped the injecting, but we carried on seeing them for a subsequent 12 weeks to see what happened after they finished doing the injections. And we decided our, our primary outcome measure was measuring the severity, the movement severity of their Parkinson's disease using this measure called the UPDRS part three. And we did this first thing in the morning before the patients had taken their regular medication, 
So we had a little window into what the underlying severity of their Parkinson's disease looked like. And this is what we found. You've seen this already. Uh, people on placebo injections, over the course of the 48 weeks, they gradually deteriorated. And that's what's to be expected in Parkinson's disease. Things get worse year on year. And the people on exenotide, they had an early improvement just over the first 12 weeks, which was interesting. We worked, this, this raises a question. This isn't just stopping cells dying. It seems to be doing something to make people feel better. But then over the course of the 12 to the 48 week period, things looked fairly stable. Once people stopped the injections at 48 weeks, you see the blue line takes a bit of an upturn. Now, they don't deteriorate to be as bad as those on placebo, but there is that, that, that early effect between 0 and 12 weeks appears to be partially lost when people stop the drug between 48 and 60 weeks. But overall, having been static between the, the, the weeks of 12 and 48, that means that there's a, a difference between the two groups at the 60 week time point. And so this means that we met our primary outcome. And so this, this was an exciting, um, tantalizing effect to report. Of course, there are criticisms of this. This was only 60 patients, and it comes back to the question about what sample size is important. And the sample size depends on how big an effect you're going to get and how variable this is. There may have been some biases in this trial. You know, perhaps even though we randomised into the two groups, perhaps the randomization process wasn't perfect and there were slight differences. And perhaps the placebo group were always going to get worse and the xenotai group weren't going to be. And that, that's what we have to make adjustments for. And you can use statistics to adjust for baseline differences. And despite adjusting, we found the same beneficial effects of xenotide. But we, did, we were left with a question about whether there was a significant symptomatic effect that disappears at the end of exenotide, or whether the, the, the bulk of the effect was really a neuroprotective or disease-modifying effect. So that brings us to where we are now. So we've got funding, and we've got the permissions in place to start the, the phase three trial. It hasn't started yet, but it will... Um, I'm led to believe we should have everything, even the, the I's dotted and the T's crossed, in the next two or three weeks. So we're going to do another randomized, double-blind, parallel group placebo-controlled trial. This time it's over 96 weeks. The objective of the trial is to firstly see if we can reproduce what we found before. That's important. We want to see if we can have an impact on Parkinson's, not just in the UPDRS part three, the movement things, but in other things as well perhaps thinking, perhaps mood, perhaps the whole range of non-motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease. We want to make sure that we can reproduce the effects, not just in our single centre at UCL, but across all the different centres that we're going to have in the UK. Because if we, can't, if we can only do it in one centre, and these aren't reproducible in other centres, then perhaps this, this isn't a strong enough effect. And we need to try and tease out if this is an, a small effect that occurs and disappears at the end of exposure, or if there's a, a cumulative thing. So let me show you what I mean by that. So this is what we found last time. This is the first 48 weeks when people were all injecting with the drug. What we want to find is if there's difference, which is relatively small, so it's between minus one and a bit, to mi from one and a bit to minus two and a bit. So there's about three and a half points difference between the two groups. That's good, but it's, it's actually relatively small in the whole scheme of Parkinson's disease. But if this, is, if this is the only effect, it's quite small. However, if this is the effect that you get for every year you're exposed to exenotide, then of course over the years this adds up to a very, very important effect. So what we're hoping is that over the course of 96 weeks, we see an effect that does start to grow. And if we show that the 96-week data is better than the 48-week data, then I think we're home and dry. So this is a multi-centre trial. So I'll, I'll be the, the um, investigator at UCL. Marios will be the investigator at King's, Camille in Plymouth, Michelle in Oxford, Monty in Manchester, and Gordon Duncan in Edinburgh. We will hopefully have all of those centres open, perhaps by the early new year. We need to make sure every centre has everything it needs before we open. Um, we'll open UCL, as I say, in the next two or three weeks, 
and then it'll be Oxford and King's and Plymouth and Manchester and Edinburgh thereafter. And we're going to recruit this type of patient. They have to have Parkinson's disease, of course. They have to be relatively good. So the hernia stage 2.5 means that when I see them and I grab their shoulders and I pull them backwards, I don't have to catch them. So that shows that they've got enough balance that their, their, their um, stage of Parkinson's disease is still good enough that they're not going to fall over and start hurting themselves in the middle of the trial. Because if people do fall over and hurt themselves, then your data gets um, completely um, noisy because of incidents such as falls and arm fractures and hip fractures and head injuries, and it's hard to see the wood from the trees. We're going to recruit people between the ages of 25 and 80. It's not ages, it's because exenatide is only licensed up to the age of 75. And we're pushing the boundaries a little bit because we did recruit people up to the age of 75 in the last trial and they carried on injecting for a period of time. And so we do have some data to suggest that up to the age of 80 is safe enough. We can't push it further than that, otherwise the, the MHRA won't let us. They have to be on dopaminergic treatment already. And the reason being that over the course of two years, we expect most people, even a brand new patient with Parkinson's, over two years, they may start needing dopaminergic treatment. And that can hide any effect size we see from exenatide. If they've already started dopaminergic treatment, then we won't lose that ability to, to see the difference that occurs. That, that big effect will have passed already. They need to be able to administer the medication, that goes without saying, and they've got to give us um, their informed consent. So the inclusion criteria are quite broad, so most people with Parkinson's disease will fall into those groups. But we've got some exclusions as well. So if we think they've got some other cause for their Parkinsonism, of course that's not Parkinson's disease. They need to be able to come to the centre first thing in the morning without taking their pills. Now that's the biggest um, issue. If someone can't get about first thing in the morning without taking their pills, then they won't be able to come to the visit and we won't be able to see how good or bad they are. And so it's a, an issue that there'll be people who do struggle without their levodopa, who want to participate in the trial, but it's just practically impossible. We, can't, we don't have the funding to admit people overnight to, to make this possible. We will do our very best to accommodate as many people as possible. So this unable or able just depends perhaps a little bit on um, our ingenuity. The body mass index, that's a, a ratio of your height and your weight. If you're too skinny, you won't be able to participate. And that's because this drug causes weight loss. So for most people, weight loss is a good thing. However, if you're very skinny, weight loss is a dangerous thing. And so we can't recruit people who might be vulnerable to becoming unwell or as a result of being underweight. If they've got some brain problem, that means that they may have an issue over the next two years, then we can't recruit them. If they already have significant dementia, or if they already have quite profound depression, or if they've had some previous brain procedure, such as deep brain stimulation, then we've, we've decided not to recruit them because things like deep brain stimulation can have such a profound effect on Parkinson's disease and it can be changed during the course of the follow-up that it might again hide our ability to see the effects of exenatide. There's a lot of exclusion criteria. So if someone's been in a trial beforehand, let's say they've been in the UDCA trial and we think UDCA slows down disease progression, then we can't stick them straight in the exenotide trial because we don't know what the UDCA has done to their natural history of Parkinson's disease. So we need to be sensible about recruiting people who have already been in previous trials. If they've previously been exposed to exenotide, either because they've had diabetes or because they've, they've managed to access this um, through um, some Parkinson's clinic, then of course it's going to confound our ability to see what exenotide does. And if they've got kidney problems, we, we need to be careful because the, the exenotide is excreted in the kidneys. Pancreatitis is a concern that was raised about exenotide 
about five, six, seven years ago, in the biggest follow-up studies, I'm talking of, you know, a million plus people in the United States who have been on exenatide, there is no increased risk of pancreatitis with exenatide compared to other diabetes medications. But nevertheless, the FDA in the United States have suggested there's ongoing monitoring for pancreatitis in people that have prescribed this. So if someone has a history of pancreatitis and therefore might be at risk of getting pancreatitis again, then we don't want them in the trial because that may put a big black mark against exenatide where it's not um, necessary or it's just more of a chance finding. We don't want to recruit people with diabetes because we know that they get better with, with exenatide in terms of their blood sugar. And we want to see what effect it has on Parkinson's disease, not on Parkinson's and diabetes together. But it might be that if we find we have positive results in Parkinson's, then that's the very type of patient who has got a double chance of success with exenatide because it's going to help their diabetes and their Parkinson's as well. So we'll not include people in the trial, but we bear in mind that these might be the people that respond the best. I mentioned the GLP-1 receptors in the stomach. GLP-1 receptors in the stomach slow stomach emptying. And that's important for absorption of levodopa. So if someone has very poor absorption of levodopa because of a gastroparesis, that's slow stomach emptying, then of course we don't want to make that worse. Having a very high blood lipid is a risk factor for pancreatitis, so we don't want people that might get that. If you give 50 times the adult human dose to a rat, then they get a thyroid cancer. And although there's been no people that have developed thyroid cancer with exenatide, of course, if they're at risk of thyroid cancer already, then we don't want to be misled or confused by recruiting them to the trial. So there's a lot of um, reasons why we can't recruit people, but all of those reasons are actually... Um, applicable to only a tiny number of individuals. Most people haven't had pancreatitis, most people haven't had thyroid cancer, most people with Parkinson's haven't got diabetes. So it's in all likelihood these exclusions and inclusion criteria mean that most people with Parkinson's, provided they can get up in the morning and get to, get to the relevant centre, will be eligible for the trial. So this is the overview. People will be pre-screened then this is a, a telephone call, you know, do you meet these criteria? Then they'll go for a formal screening process where we look to see how their depression and, and their dementia scores are. And they have a formal off-medication visit when they're randomised to either have placebo or exenatide for the next 96 weeks. They won't know which group they're randomised in, and nor will we. But someone will have the uh, master list and will be able to tell us at the end of the trial, or should there be a need to uncover... Um, at an interim time point. They'll need to come for a short visit at weeks 12, 36, 60 and 84, but a longer visit where we repeat the off-medication assessment at weeks 24, 48 and 72. They will stop the medication at 96 weeks and we'll do a last telephone call 10 weeks afterwards just so we can complete any adverse event reporting. So this is our primary outcome, which is the UPDRS part three. This is a questionnaire where we, uh, it's not a questionnaire, it's a, it's a way of evaluating people based on 18 different items from speech, facial expression, rigidity, slowness, stiffness, walking balance, etc. And, and everybody has scored between zero and four for each item. So the maximum score is 132. We'll do several secondary outcomes as well, including the other sections of the UPDRS, a timed walk, cognitive assessments, dyskinesia rating scale, the depression, the quality of life, non-motor symptoms, how much levodopa they're needing, and in a diary of how they are over the course of three days. We will look at healthcare resource use in, in the longer term, but that really depends on if we show that this is a useful drug or not. You know, no one's interested in its cost effectiveness if it doesn't help. So every team will have the local PI, and I've shown you the list of those, but they'll also need someone um, to rate the primary outcome, they'll need someone to advise on any adverse events. You know, if someone says, I've lost a terrible amount of weight, I've had a change in bowel habit, we'll want to give them the best advice, but we don't want that person to be the primary outcome who's rating how bad their Parkinson's is, because that might potentially unblind them if they've lost weight, for example. They will be given a contact number 
and uh, if there's a problem associated with the trial um, over the 96 week period. So we're going to recruit over a, an 18 month period. So we've estimated if we recruit one person a week, then we'll recruit 50 people over the course of a year. And because we've got six sites, you know, we, we'll be home and dry. We only need 200 people overall. If we recruit one person a week, however, because they need to come back every 12 weeks, then the number of visits gets bigger and bigger. And each team at each site is going to be a, a, just a handful of people. And so we, we're not going to try and recruit everybody in the first few weeks. We've got to stagger recruitment to make sure we've got sufficient numbers of people to look after the patients properly during the course of their 96 week follow up. And we need to make sure that everyone's well looked after. Everyone should have a discussion about what the trial involves, what the benefits are of trial participation. So even people that randomised to receive placebo, they will have a 12 week evaluation you know, to discuss any adverse events. They'll have a detailed evaluation of the severity of their Parkinson's disease, any non-motor symptoms, any difficulties they're having with their regular medication. And so being involved in the trial is a, a beneficial aspect of Parkinson's disease, even if the, the allocated placebo, or even if the drug appears to be unhelpful at the end. They'll have their travel expenses met, and we'll emphasize the importance that they stay in the trial throughout the whole 96 week period. If people drop out, people can drop out of course, if they do drop out, then we'll have less information about whether this drug is helpful or not. And so we want to look people in the eye at the start and see if they're committed to get to the end of the trial so we have an answer about whether this drug is indeed helpful or not. We're going to do a few sub-studies. The first is digital technology. And the second is imaging. So I'm going to talk about both of these. Both of these have been funded by the Cure Parkinson's Trust. So digital technology, the objectives are to look to see if we can use either a smartphone or a sensor to get a better measure of Parkinson's severity than this UPDRS scale that we do um, traditionally. And we want to see how acceptable these, these measures are and we want to see um, whether these measures can predict which of our 200 people are likely to do the best. So what it is, you take your phone and with a special app on the phone, it can record your voice and get a score for your voice. It will assess your balance when you're standing still on the spot. It will assess your walking. It will assess your tapping speed on the screen. It will test your reaction time. And will, it will rate your tremor when your hand is resting and your tremor when your hand is out straight. So it's embracing the fact that a phone has all the accelerometers in it to measure many aspects of Parkinson's disease that are relevant to, to people. And we'll also strap um, this activity sensor to the, the bottom of the, the lower back and patients will wear this for a week to see how the, the movement changes over the course of the 96 week period and get better data about the real impact on Parkinson's, not just one of these um, quick cross-sectional measures that we traditionally do. So this will be done at baseline and then at six and at 12 months using both of these two devices. The second thing is to do some imaging because in the last trial we did um, some scans, these are DAT scan images, looking to see how many dopamine cells are present at the start and how many present at the end. So it's, it's really what we think we are trying to do is to measure the effect of a drug to slow down the loss in, of, of the, the dopamine as representative of all the pathways in Parkinson's disease. And we did find in the last trial that there was a small advantage of exenatide in three areas of, of, of the, the dopamine pathways within the brain where there is no um, areas in the brain where placebo could lead to an advantage. So I'm going to finish there, hopefully have a couple of minutes for questions. This is a, a big team um, that are involved in trying to test this drug now and over the last few years. And we're indebted to multiple funding agencies, of course, including the Secure Parkinson's Trust. So thank you for your attention.